want you to say glory. glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we're ready to praise the Lord now. We're going to sing some wonderful songs. We're going to start with hymn number 435, the glory song. Now, I like to do things up a little bit because I find that when we sing hymns, we sometimes just sing them, you know, just sing them. So I want us to just focus on the words today. We're singing about what glory we're going to experience when we see the face of Jesus. Amen? So what I would like us to do, there's three verses, right? Three verses. I would like the ladies to sing the first verse. And when we come into the chorus and it says, that will be glory, I want you to hold the glory with me. Be gloried for me, okay? Because we need to picture what it's going to be like to see Jesus, okay? Is that, is that okay with you? And then on the second verse, I want the gentlemen to sing. And then on the third verse, we're all going to come together. We're going to make it like a choir. Just try to emulate what, what it sounds like with the angels in heaven. Amen? Okay, so let's do this. You're on. Okay, ladies. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. Everyone, oh, that will be. some parts now and the, the, you can hear the men I want to hear the ladies together friends will be there that amen okay let's turn to hymn number 522 my hope is built on nothing less but who Jesus Christ amen hymn number 522 
everyone together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness I want everyone to stand up when he shall come with trumpet sound. We should be excited about standing up for the Lord, for he is coming back. Amen? When he shall come. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have the ladies sing the first verse, the gentlemen sing the second verse, and then the third verse we're going to sing together, and then we're going to sing together the last verse, but without music, so we could hear our voices just crying out for the Lord, working in our lives moment by moment. Amen? Okay. <laughs> Dying with Jesus by death reckoned life, living for Jesus a new life divine, looking to Jesus till glory does shine, moment by moment, oh Lord, I am thine. All together. Everyone together.
that he doth not feel, never a sickness that he cannot heal. Moment by moment, in woe or in will, Jesus, my Savior, abides with me still. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I've life from above. Looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, oh Lord, the Lord. You sound beautiful this morning. Amen? God is so good. Thank you for singing with me. Can you pull up our theme song? We have a theme song, by the way. <clears throat> theme song. You don't have? Growing in Christ? You don't have the words? Okay. We will do Love Lifted Me. <laughs> That's what we did last night. Shall we all stand together? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore.
And praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. How many of you are happy to be in the house of the Lord? Let me see your hands. If you are happy to be in the house of the Lord, say amen. amen. If you are happy to be in the house of the Lord, say hallelujah. If you are happy to be in the house of the Lord, say, thank you, Jesus. You see, friends, you better get used to it. Because uh, that's what will happen in heaven. Throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, we will sing his praises. And the redeemed, along with the angels, will say, Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor. For thou hast created all things and all things were created for thee. Amen? So that's why the psalmist said, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all your lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. And the people of God said, and the church is thus called to worship. At this time, first of all, let me go through the order of service, and then the rest will be unannounced. Uh, the, the next item on the, on the program will be Brother Roderick. He'll be singing, followed by our new treasure, a wonderful human being, Brother Bisingi, our treasure of the conference, followed by the scripture reading, which will be done by Brother Kibi, the uh, principal of our academy, and uh, followed by Another wonderful human being, I'm saying it in his presence. I'm not speaking behind his back. <laughs> yes, he is. I have a wonderful relationship. It's a joy working with him. He will be introducing the speaker of the hour. And now, without further ado, we would invite the members of the audience, God's people, to be in a worshipful spirit because Jesus is in our midst to bless us. times in which we live, you announce a man is singing and two women show up, that could be problematic. <laughs> we are Guy Harmony, and so 
we'll be singing together today. appreciate that. Uh, we have been redeemed and we are forever his children. Thank you everyone for being here. We just worship the Lord in singing. Now we are going to worship him by digging in our pockets. So uh, I would ask the deacon to come forward to take our offerings for today. We are going to pray before we take the offerings. Loving Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your love and for your kindness. We thank you for bringing us into your house this morning to worship you and to praise you. Thank you, dear God, for uh, this opportunity for us to meet again. As we are about to take this offering, I pray, Father, that you'll multiply it and uh, so that it will 
reach uh, to as many as possible so that your uh, kingdom can be hastened as a result of our, uh, our donation to your cause. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sabbath. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 30 through 37. I'll give you a moment to find that. We'll read that together. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. So that's Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. Maybe they could say amen when they find it. Say amen when you found it. I think we should read it. Okay. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, 
when he arrived at the place, came and looked, and he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and he said to him, Take care of him. Whatever more you sp- and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This really looks nice. Hugwash, people in the auditorium. Yeah, it's a little bit warm. It's going to get a lot warmer this afternoon. I'm going to say, please drink lots of water. The Humidex has the potential of going to 40. So hydrate yourselves, please. But we are blessed. We are blessed. There is one announcement before we have prayer. Um, Ron sent me a text that there are a few vehicles around cabin 78 that are actually parked on our septic field. That is not a good thing, okay? So if if that's one of your vehicles, could you please move it because that is just not a good thing, okay? Thank you very much for understanding. There is a parking area for everybody to park in, and if you're not sure where it is, Ron said to please contact him, and he will show you where to park. So if you're, if you're in that area, please remove your vehicle from, from that because, well, he told me if, if the vehicle crushes it, it's about a $100,000 fix. And yeah, I think we can put $100,000 a lot better places on this camp, amen? All right, thank you for that. Another announcement, please keep Carol Casey in your prayers. Um, This morning, they're not sure what happened, but they did take her by ambulance to the hospital and they're running some tests on her to try and figure out what happened. And so Jeremy asked that I would mention that so that we could be praying for her. So they're, they're they're gonna be running tests probably all day today he said but um, yeah just please please keep her in your prayer as well and now I would like to uh, have you please stand while we pray Heavenly Father uh, our hearts are filled already the music that we've had, the scripture reading. Lord, we are eagerly anticipating the word that is going to come from you through your servant Mike's mouth. Father, I pray that as we are gathered here together, You have said where there are two or three gathered, you will be there. And Father, we have an auditorium full here. Our kids division is doing well. Our youth division is doing well. And so Lord, 
We ask for your angels to be around this campground. We ask for protection around this campground. We know that Satan wants nothing more than to try and destroy the good that you are doing here this week. This is your campground, Lord. It's not ours. This is your holy ground. And may we always remember that. Father, we lift Carol up to you this morning. We're not sure what the status is, and we likely won't know until maybe even tomorrow. But Father, you, you know. You even have the hairs of her head numbered. You know what she needs right now, and we just praise you that you are the one that trained the physicians, the incredible bodies that you gave us, and you have shown them how to heal them through you. All healing comes from you, God. And so we lift her up and we just ask you to be with them. We ask for you to be with the family, give them a peace that passes all understanding. And uh, Lord, we're awaiting the good news that everything is just fine. So Lord, we pray again for Pastor Mike as he is about to share the message that you have placed on his heart. Lord, may we open our hearts, may we open our minds, and Father, may we be receptive to the words that you want to share with us today. We thank you for this beautiful campground. We thank you for the opportunity to get together as friends and family, as new friends, and Lord, we just praise you for the blessings that you bestow upon us. And we thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath, and we pray all this in your precious name, dear Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, it is my privilege to introduce to you our speaker for the dower, for the week. We're anxiously awaiting. We had a wonderful message last night, and we know that we won't be disappointed again. And I can say that because any time we are giving God's word, we know that it's going to be a good word. Amen? And so at this time, I would like to ask Pastor Mike Tucker to come up here. We are so grateful that, you know, you have ventured from Texas. Yeah, I, I, you know, he keeps reminding me that this is a cool day there. It's a spring day. Yeah. It's a spring day, it's a spring day there. Spring day. And I keep telling him, please come visit me like in January because that's really my comfort zone. <laughs> I, I, I don't have enough clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we got too many. <laughs> yeah, you got too many. It's true. <laughs> but anyway, we are blessed that he is able to come and share with us for this week. And he was able to bring his lovely wife with him. And she's no stranger to these areas. You all know her. And welcome home, Pam. Mm -hmm. And so we're just glad that we can be blessed with a word from above through you today. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Contrary to popular opinion, in July and August, Texas is not actually hell. However, you can see it from there. Just a little glow off in the distance. Yeah. It is hot, there's no doubt. And so uh, I, I did acquiesce, I took off my tie. Uh, I'm an old school Adventist preacher, and so 110 doesn't matter. I, I preach in coat and tie. But uh, in, in deference to our conference president, I, last night I even took off the jacket. It's, it's Sabbath morning. I can't do that today. I'm sorry. I'm just old school. You, you take off my jacket and my tie, I can't get two words out because I'm an old Adventist preacher. And what do you, what do you expect from me? Uh, I believe that the character of God is the defining issue as we get closer to the end of time. Anything that the devil can do to distort his character is something he wants to do and something he does regularly. And I believe that all of us have at times fallen prey to a distortion of God's character. And I think more than anything else, Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. 
Because if you've seen Jesus, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. And that's why I treasure so much the Gospels, because they reveal the Father to us through the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we have another example of that today in Luke's Gospel. We, we read the, the parable to you, but there's a prelude to the parable that we want to take a look at first. And that is found in verse 30, uh, 25 of Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. So if you have a Bible, whether it be electronic or uh, a paper one like mine, uh, please open up to that and follow along. Jesus has just sent out 70 of his disciples, two by two, all across the land. They've come back with a fantastic report. They're praising God for that. He's giving them further instruction and thanking them for, for their service to him and acknowledging what the Spirit does through us. And now he begins to teach the, the broader audience. And that means that there are those there who were sent to, to tempt him. Verse 25, and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit life, eternal life? Now, when a preacher preached in those days, when a teacher would teach, he would sit down. That means that you're more rested and you can talk longer. Aren't you glad I'm not going to do that? <laughs> There's a limit to how long I can talk. I'm 70 years old and I have to stand up. So, you know, we'll, we'll get out of here for too long. But in those days, the teacher would sit down. And then a student who wanted to show deference to the teacher and show respect would stand and respectfully asked a question and then would be seated as the teacher would give the answer. So this man stood up as though he were uh, posing as a student. I'm showing respect to you, but in reality, Luke gives this away, he's trying to trip Jesus up. He's trying to test him. And so he asked a question, but have you noticed the flaw in the question? There's a flaw in the question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What do you do to inherit anything? Nothing. <laughs> An inheritance is a gift given to you, usually upon a person's death, because you're in relationship with them. Uh, a, a little over a year ago, I inherited something from my Aunt Maxine. Maxine, uh, I was born on her birthday, and so we celebrated our birthdays together quite often. Uh, through the years, up until I was 20, I think it was every birthday we, we celebrated together. And as, you know, I grew up and had a job and all, all we did that less frequently, but she, she was a wonderful aunt. Now, Aunt Maxine did not have a lot of money, and so Pam and I had to go down to where her trailer house was and sort through her things, and that took forever because the woman had home shopping network on speed dial. <laughs> and so having a, the garage sale, we paid off her debts pretty much, and, and what was left over for me was about $1,000, so I don't actually retire on that, just want you to know. But, but still, there was an inheritance, and, and I really did nothing to, to earn that other than the fact that I was Aunt Maxine's nephew, and that's how you inherit something. I, you don't earn it. You don't work for it. You receive it because you're in relationship. The same thing is true with your salvation. You're in relationship with Jesus. He gives you the gift. It's an inheritance. It is not by your sweat, the sweat of your brow, or your obedience that you get this. Because you know He loves you, that love changes you. It makes you a different person. But you don't earn the salvation. And so there's a flaw in His question. Jesus immediately spots the fact that this man is trying to test Him trying to trip him up. So he gets a bit cagey with him, and he answers the question with a question. So again, remember the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? So now he's, he's just kind of feeling him out here. All right, so you're trying to test me, so you tell me, what, what does the law say? What is written in the law? Now, again, the, the attorney, the lawyer, knows that Jesus is being cagey. And so he answers back with an answer that he actually pulls from Jesus' teachings. It says, um, and he answered, verse 27, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now he is quoting Jesus, who had been asked at one point, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is actually quoting two places in the Old Testament, one from Leviticus and the other from Deuteronomy. 
Now, the interesting thing about putting those two passages together is there's no place in previous Jewish literature where those two passages had ever been linked. Jesus links them. He says the one and the other, they go together. Love for God, love for fellow man. We see it in the structure of the Ten Commandments, the first four being about love for God, the last six being about our love for our fellow man. And so Jesus had linked those two passages from the Old Testament together as being the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment, in essence, is love. Love God, love each other. And so the man had heard him do this because, again, it, this had not been done in any of the Jewish literature prior to Jesus. He's the first to have done this. And he just quotes back what he's already heard Jesus say. This is a little game of cat and mouse going on, right? A little game of cat and mouse. And so Jesus, you know, they're just playing the little verbal sparring here. Um, and so Jesus said, fine. Uh, Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, on the, on the surface, it sounds like Jesus is saying, all right, if you'll love God and you'll love each other, if you can do those things, you will inherit, you will earn your inheritance of eternal life. But in reality, he's not even saying that. Because the truth is, the, the standard is not uh, that we avoid bad behavior. The standard for entrance to heaven is perfect love. Perfect love for God, perfect love for fellow man. Frankly, I've not been perfectly loving for five minutes in my life. I've avoided doing bad things for at least five minutes and even thinking bad thoughts for that long. That's an easier standard, quite frankly. But that's not the standard for heaven. The standard for heaven is perfectly loving, and I've not been perfectly loving for five minutes. And if I could ever achieve that standard of perfectly loving for five minutes, I'd be so proud of it that that, too, would be a sin. And there I would have blown the whole thing, right? So the standard is impossibly high. When he's saying, do this and you will live, he might as well be saying, stand flat-footed and jump over that 10-foot wall without touching it. You can't do that. It's an impossibility. And you and I, born into sin, cannot be perfectly loving, not even for five minutes. We can't love God perfectly. We can't love each other perfectly because there will always be mixed motives. That's who we are. That's the nature of sin. And so Jesus is saying, fine, give that a shot. See how that works out for you. Now, the lawyer, though, is convinced that he can do it. But in order to do it, he's got to define terms. And so verse 28, and he said to him, uh, pardon, verse 28, he said to him, you've answered, well, do this and you will live. Verse, verse 29, but wishing to justify himself, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? To justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? All right, the first part of this, he wanted to justify himself. Can you justify yourself? The answer is no. You are justified by your faith in the blood of Jesus, what he has done for you. It is for, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest any should boast. We're told that by the Apostle Paul. So he could not justify himself, but he's, he has this mindset of a performance-based religion. If he can just raise high the standard. But in order to do that, you also have to define terms because you realize that it's impossibility. But if I can narrow the scope of this, maybe then it's manageable. So, all right, so who's my neighbor, he's saying. Now, there are about three different ways that Jesus could answer the question. The, the lawyer was expecting one of those two ways, but certainly not the third. The first way that Jesus could answer the question is, every Jew is your neighbor, and you should love every Jew. That's a bit too broad. He was hoping that that wouldn't be the case because some Jews, he said, were stinkers. He just didn't like them. Some of them he referred to as just outright sinners. Jesus could answer the question, Every Jew who keeps the law like you do. All right, now this is manageable. Because even though some of them aren't particularly likable, we, we, we have a lot of agreement, and I can, I can put up with this. The answer that he never dreamed Jesus would give him is, everybody's your neighbor. Everyone on the planet is your neighbor. He, that didn't even enter his mind. And so he asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus now tells a parable. And in the parable, he doesn't really answer the question. He answers the correct question, which we'll see later on. Now, when Jesus tells parables, you have to understand that Jesus was a Jewish theologian. And Jewish theologians, when they want to give you theology, their theology, they do it as a parable. The parable is not a sermon illustration. The parable is not an entertaining story. The parable does not illustrate theology. The parable is the theology. 
Our theologians today, we say, state a premise. We give supporting evidence from the passage. We look at uh, the culture. We look at word studies and all sorts of other ways of analyzing the, pas the passage. We'll bring in what this authority and that authority says. We'll tie it all together, and then we'll restate the premise saying we've proven our premise. That's a Western way of thinking. But the Jewish thought was, here's my theology. Here's a parable. Figure out the parable. You have my theology. So Jesus is now laying some theology on the man because he's telling a parable and everyone understands. The man's asked a theological question and Jesus is answering with the parable. So he tells this parable. Jesus re replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. Now Jerusalem was the pinnacle not only was it built on, on a mountain, uh, a very high hill, really, um, but it was also the pinnacle of Jewish religious um, life, Jewish political life, Jewish legal life, Jewish social life. Everything was on Jer Jerusalem. So when you left Jerusalem, it didn't matter if you were going to Mount Everest, you went down. <laughs> Every place on the globe, when you leave Jerusalem, we're going down to wherever it is you're going. We're going down to Everest. We're going down to Jericho. We're going down because we are at the pinnacle now, and every place else is sociologically, theoretically, and uh, geologically down. Every, all points are down from Jer Jerusalem. So this man goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and that's a trip of about 17 miles. And it really is down a, a mountain, so to speak, and it's a winding course, and it's a lot of places for robbers to hide. And it was a notorious robe where uh, bandits would hide out. Uh, even as late as the 1950s, when William Barclay wrote his um, commentary on the New Testament, he mentioned that that road between Jerusalem and Jericho at that day was still notorious for having robbers. And they had a characteristic at that time that they had during Jesus' day, and that is this. If you were accosted by the robbers, and they asked for something, and you gave it to them, they would let you pass unharmed. But if you resisted, they would beat you and either kill you or leave you wishing that you were dead. This man, when he was accosted by robbers, attempted to resist. And they beat him, and they left him as dead. They stripped him. So he's naked, unconscious, lying by the road as though he were dead, and he may be for anyone passing by. They took everything he had, and they left him there. The poor fellow resisted, and he shouldn't have. That was a common story. People expected that. People understood it. It was not out of the ordinary that this should happen. So they left him there for dead. By the way, it is assumed that the, the traveler in the story is a Jew because Jesus does not identify him as anything else. But anyone passing by would not know that. So let's take a look at the next verse. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, the priesthood was an inherited position. It came all from the same family from, uh, from Aaron, Moses' brother. It was a tribe of Levi, but from that family came all the priests. You were paid well to be a priest. However, at that time, there were so many priests, you might only work anywhere from two to four weeks out of the year, and you got a full year's salary for being a priest. That meant that the other 48 weeks, 48 to 50 weeks of the year, you have, were free to engage in other money-making opportunities. And they did that, and it was a wealthy class. Most all of them were extremely wealthy. They also almost all lived in Jericho. They didn't live in Jerusalem, they lived in Jericho. And when the lot would fall upon them, they would then make the trip from uh, Jericho up to Jerusalem to serve for usually two weeks. When you made that trip, you would take two people with you. You would take a, a Levite, that means someone else from the tribe of Levi, whose job it was to work in the, in the employee of the temple and to help with the temple services. They were not a priest, but they would assist the priest. And then you could also take one layman who would help the Levite with his work. And this was a great honor for the Levite as well as for the layman. And so you wanted to be chosen. You would, it, it might be expensive for you, but you would put everything aside in order to go and help. So it is likely that this priest has taken with him the Levite and a layman 
They've spent two weeks working in the temple, and now at the close of those two weeks, the, the, le- the priest is going home. The priest is riding a, a donkey, no doubt, because he's wealthy. And if you have a 17-mile journey and you have the option of riding or of walking, you ride. And so the priest, no doubt, was on a, a donkey. Now, the, the Levite and the layman may not have been as wealthy, so they were likely to follow by walking. When the priest came upon the man on the side of the road, the, he wanted to do the right thing, but the right thing to him was prescribed by law. It, and so there were certain laws about what you were to do when someone was injured and needed your assistance. According to the laws that they had been developed in that time, if this was not a Jew, although you could render assistance, you were not required to. You were not required to. But if it was a Jew, it didn't matter, living or dead, you had to do whatever you had to do in order to help them. So he's first trying to ascertain, is this a Jew or not? Well, you would tell a person is a Jew by their language, their accent, their dress. And since the man is unconscious and and naked, none of those things present themselves. The only way then to further examine whether or not this is a, uh, a, a Jew would be indelicate to say the least, because you're looking for the signs of circumcision. And so that would be awkward and indelicate. And so basically he decided not to touch him because if he touched the man and he was dead, now the priest would be ceremonially unclean. That means he would have to turn around and go back to Jerusalem. He's already spent two weeks there and arrange for a costly week-long purification ceremony. He's already been gone two weeks. Basically, this trip is going to turn out to be a a three-and-a-half to four-week trip if he has to go back and do that, and it's going to cost him something. If he touches the man and he's alive, but later he dies, the same thing happens. He has to go back and go through the purification ceremony. That is required. In fact, if he tries to minister in the temple, not having gone through the purification ceremony, the young men of the temple were instructed they were to take him out back and beat him until the brains came out of his head. That's what they were instructed to do. That's how serious this was. If the man was alive and a Jew, he was required to render aid. So as he looks at the man, he cannot tell if he's dead or alive, Jew or Gentile. He ascertains that the man is either already dead or not a Jew, and he just goes by, leaving him where he is. He made a judgment call, and that's what he, those were the factors most likely that were influencing his call. He left the man there. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, the Levite's got a problem. He doesn't have the money of his his, uh, priestly buddy, and he's just been honored by the priest to come down there and to, to work in the temple in Jerusalem for these two weeks. So he's honored by that fact. But he knows that his priest, who has an animal, has gone ahead of him, and he's already made the judgment call. We have a runner. <laughs> hey, buddy. We got two runners? Oh, well, we, yeah, we got a big runner and a little runner. And the big runner wins. <laughs> Bye-bye, little buddy. <laughs> you know, I think he was more entertaining than me. <laughs> so the Levite comes, and he realized that his buddy, the priest, has already come by. And he's decided that this is either a dead man or not a Jew. Therefore, he was not required to help him. If the Levite ignores what his priest has decided and goes ahead and touches the man and discovers that he's a Jew and he's alive and he's helped him, he just has shown up his priest. He's not going to get another invitation to go help in the temple. He knows that. And he thinks about this. And he figures, I'm safest trusting the opinion of my priest who I know has just gone by here. I don't know the law better than he does. I don't know better than he does about the identity of this man or his condition. So I'm just going to leave him as did my priest. And he goes by on the other side. Now, when you're telling a story about three individuals in ascending or descending order, you would expect that the next character in this story would be, in in fact, the layman. that's what you would normally think. A good joke would start that way, right? There's a Levi, a, 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 a priest, a Levite, and a layman. And the priest, the Levite, and then you would think that the punchline would come with the layman. But Jesus throws us a curveball here. The third person in the story is not the layman. The third person in the story is someone who every Jew 
despises. I cannot explain to you how much they hated the Samaritans, but the hatred was palpable. But a Samaritan, verse 33, who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. That word means that his heart broke with empathy for the man who was laying by the road. We don't see that word describing the priest's reaction. We don't see it describing the Levite's reaction. We see it describing the Samaritan's reaction. Now, you have to understand how much they hated the Samaritans. When uh, the Jews were taken into the Babylonian captivity, a small group of Jews were left behind to care for the land and the buildings until their return. And they were instructed, just don't intermarry with the surrounding pagan nations. Keep yourselves pure. When the Jews came back after those 70 years of captivity, the people here had intermarried. And so now, as far as the Jews returning who were pure blood, you are no longer pure blood, you're not among us. And although they've been taking care of the land for 70 years, they said, you may not help us build the walls, you may not help us build the temple, you are excluded, you're persona non grata, you are no longer a part of the chosen people. And so, because of this, wars were fought between these two groups. The Samaritans then uh, uh, claimed a piece of property there that was just a little bit north of Judah, uh, Judea, and they built their own temple. They accepted the first five books of the Bible, the law, but they did not accept the prophets. They had a new religion that was a mixture of Judaism and paganism, and they had their own temple. And wars have been fought for the last four to five hundred years between these two groups of people. They hated each other. Uh, one time the Jews attacked Samaria and they burned down their temple. Just, just meanness. Just, there was no strategic advantage to that. And the Samaritans were not strong enough to overcome the Jews at that time. So later, they came down to Jerusalem on the eve before Passover began. They, they gained entrance into the temple, and they scattered the bones of dead men across the temple, making it unclean, which meant that they could not hold Passover that year. There was no strategic advantage to this. This is just pure meanness and vandalism. Just to get even, you burned our temple. Here, you can't use yours either. That's, I mean, that's the kind of tit for tat that was going back between these two groups. If an Orthodox Jew was walking down the street and you saw a Samaritan walking toward you, you would cross the street to make sure that his shadow did not cross you. You did not want his shadow touching you. You hated the Samaritans. They were the worst kind of people on earth. They were a scum. You despised them. And Jesus has chosen to make Samaritans the hero of his story. Now, if, if that doesn't stick in the craw of most any Jew, then nothing would. But Jesus is making a point. As the Apostle Paul says, in him there is no Greek or, or, or Jew, no Gentile, no, no Greek, no Jew, no male, no female. We are all one in his sight. A Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast, so he's a wealthy man, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Everyone on journeys carried with them bandages. They carried um, oil, usually olive oil. As, as, if they got hurt, it would be a soothing, healing agent, and wine. There was a very small... Um, alcohol content in their wine because it was home brewed uh, and usually about three to five percent alcohol but it was enough to cleanse a wound and so they would they would pour wine on it to cleanse it they would um, put uh, oil on it to soothe it and then bandage they carried all three of those things for just this purpose the Samaritan had those in his possession and he used them to take care of this man who was naked laying by the side of the road perhaps even dead he found him, he realized he was alive, and he, he pours the oil on him. And he takes him to an inn to take care of him. Archaeologists have never found an inn outside of a town in Jerusalem, uh, in, um, in Palestine. All inns were inside of a city or a town, which meant that this man, this Samaritan, who is hated by the people whose country he's in, took what was most likely a Jew and put him on his own donkey and marched him into this half-dead Jew into Jericho 
to find an inn. Now, I'm sorry, but prejudice, the prejudice in this country, in your country, and in, in my country, the United States, states that when you saw something like that happen, the, the really prejudiced people would say, well, we know who did that. He may be trying to look good, but we know who made him half dead. And then they're likely to attack the Samaritan. And if they don't get him on the way in, chances are good they might get him on the way out. They may be waiting for him when he leaves the town in order to show him to treat Jews this way. The man was putting himself at risk. He, he spent money, he spent his own possessions, and he put his very life at risk in order to rescue this man who probably would like to spit on him if he were alive. He did that for someone who was most likely at enmity with him. Does that remind you of anyone? This is Jesus. Jesus has made the Christ figure in this story a Samaritan, not a Jew, but a Samaritan who while we were yet at enmity, Christ died for us, for our sins. This is a passion play. And he's making the Samaritan now the Christ figure, the one you hate, the one you despise. He's made him the Christ figure. What does that say about our prejudices? What does it say? It says that it's just pure ugliness in the sight of God, that he doesn't care anything for our prejudices. On the next day, verse 35, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. Whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Why would he do this? Well, first of all, the man had no money. He was naked. So he had no way to pay for this. But by law, if the innkeeper spent more than the two denarii that the man has given to him to take care of the man, when the man is well, since he cannot repay because he has no money on him, the innkeeper is, can legally sell him into slavery. So the Samaritan is thinking, why would I save his life only to have him become a slave? So here, here's advance payment, and if it costs more than that, you know me, I stay here quite often. When I come back, I will pay you whatever more you need. He's made provision for the payment required for the healing of this man. It cost him money. It cost him significant amounts of money. And he's put his own life at risk in order to take care of this man. Now that he's told the parable, by the way, Jesus is not answering who is my neighbor? Jesus is saying, in what ways might you choose to be a neighbor to anyone in need? Because that's your neighbor, anyone in need. So what ways are you going to choose to be a neighbor? Verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Who proved to be a neighbor? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. He couldn't even say the word Samaritan. He couldn't say it. So he, uh, the one who showed mercy to him. And now here's the kicker. Jesus says something that is actually not meant to be insulting, but it is. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. You, go be like the Samaritan. <laughs> I know you hate him, but go be like the Samaritan. That's what I want you to do. Jesus has just here said, Quit trying to define who your neighbor is and who your neighbor is not. Quit trying to exclude certain people groups because you have to make the decision that you will be a neighbor. And that means that anyone in need is deserving of your help. You must prove yourself to be a neighbor. That's why I'm so excited by the report that Pastor Paul gave us about what's happening with the indigenous people and, and other things that are going on here in, in Canada. You're choosing to be a neighbor. Choosing to be a neighbor. I praise God for that. This is not an easy thing. And sometimes it will cost you. And sometimes it even means the change of life. Uh, for... 16 years, I was the leader of Faith for Today television, and our flagship program is Lifestyle Magazine. Some of you have seen it on Hope Channel and elsewhere. And I interviewed a man um, who, was, who lived in Los Angeles, and this was a man who had two sons. Both of them 
were, were born with severe physical problems, severe illnesses. One was so severely ill that by the time he was 11, this boy died in his father's arms. The other boy had bones that were so brittle that they could break doing normal little boy things. And by the time he was nine, he'd already had broken 100 bones. And so that means that Mr. Mr. Bazir, who, what his name was, had spent many hours in emergency rooms with both of his boys, but now that the older one was dead, with this younger boy as well, with broken bones because of normal activities, this boy's bones were so brittle. While he spent some of that time there, every now and then he would see that there would be someone there with a child who was obviously not their child, a, a very sick child, usually a terminally ill child. And when he would speak to them, he realized that these were workers from the state who were bringing children who were wards of the state, who were living in institutions or in hospitals, bringing them in for medical treatment because they were terminally ill. Their parents were not taking care of them. Either they were incarcerated or just had abandoned them or something. Or maybe they had been removed from the parents because of addictions. But they were terminally ill children who no one would adopt and no one would serve as foster parents for simply because of the, the, the labor-intensive care that it would, it would require. And so the state, these children would languish in hospitals and, uh, and, um, and other institutions where the state was responsible. They'd send a worker at times to take them to, for, for care. And Mr. Bazaar said, no child should ever die alone. No child should die alone. Give them to me, he said. And the state said to him, you're not even licensed to be a foster care parent. He got licensed. Well, you need extra training in order to care for them. You need the medical training because these kids take just a yeoman service. He got the training. And he was taking these children into his home. That meant that he was with them 24-7. The state would provide someone who would uh, twice a week come in and stay with the children for two or three hours while he could go get some things done. His wife continued her job so that they would have more income because there wasn't much money in caring for these, these children. But he dedicated his life. And as the, my interview with him, already 11 children had died in his arms. And he said, I'll take the next one. Send them to me. I will care for them. As I listened to this man, I thought about the, the incredible level of love. He'd put his career on hold. He had cost himself a great deal of money that he could have earned doing something far more uh, advantageous financially. And the emotional pull that this took on this man's heart and his wife, I, I just could not fathom that people would give themselves to this kind of ministry. I, was, I kept searching my own heart. I've lived my life in ministry, but would I be willing to do that? I, I couldn't answer that. I, I didn't know. I was just blown away by the quality of love that this man displayed to children he didn't know just because they needed a home and no child should die alone. By the way, did I mention that his first name is Mohammed and he's a Muslim? That's kind of what Jesus did with his story too, wasn't it? That's what he did. And I think both stories serve as a lesson to us. We cannot be respecters of person, age, nationality, religion. We all belong to him. And his grace is at work in all of us. Even those who are Samaritans in our sight, different religion, pagan, he is at work in all of us. He redeems us. He changes us. Were it not for His grace, nothing of value would ever happen. His grace is the key. Be it Mr. Brazier, the Samaritan, the Jews, or you and me.
Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this brief picture into your character and therefore the character of the Father. Thank you that our salvation is a gift from you, an inheritance provided by your death on Calvary's tree. We receive the gift freely, Lord. And now, Lord, we, we pray that that gift and the grace that accompanies it will change us, will work inside of us to make us like the Samaritan, to make us truly anxious to be a neighbor to anyone in need. Lord, make us your emissaries. Make us the ones who proclaim your love by our actions, by our, our deeds, so that others will see you and us. We thank you, Lord, for this great privilege. We give glory to your name. And now peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you this afternoon and this evening. Go find some place and get cool because you all look sweaty to me.
The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 